Inwards, outwards. Inwards, outwards. Coming up, because that's the trademark of Deb's IWOW, and we are so fortunate to have this legacy continue through Center for Peace Through Culture. Let's hit, give them a big round of applause. Andreas Engel. I want to point out that Andreas did this incredible background and that we get to perform against. And I recently looked at their offerings. There's something for everyone uh, here now, all kinds of classes, all kinds of community outreach. So it's exciting. And what else can I say as we gather together? You already know, many of you, that there's a $5 donation if you like. Is there anyone here for the first time? Is a few? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> well, welcome. You will be extra loved. <laughs> So I'm going to say and invite the first wonderful person up, and on tap will be Tina Sweet. But first, let's welcome wildly Evan Sottinger. Well, that's a hard act to follow. No, that doesn't work. Um, Anyway, um, five minutes is hard. I'm going to give you a one-minute lesson on what this is. Auto harp was invented around the 1880s, and it it started as a harp, but with a, with bars that have felt pads on them with spaces that the, that will let you make a chord. And that's it. You now know everything you need to know about our herd. I just found out on the ride over that there is a theme of food, and food starts with basic ingredients. And the basic ingredient from this song is the miller who grinds flour. And this would be at a time when money pretty much was not used, people bartered, people traded, and um, he would grind flour from the farmer, and as part of his pay, he would take some of the flour. And everybody was fine with that. Everybody, it worked for everybody. There was an old miller, and he had three sons, each of them all fully grown. When the time come to make out a will, all he had left was a little grist mill. Sing a file dig a die, go file dig a day. He called him his oldest son, said, son, oh son, my race is run. If I'm miller of you make, pray tell me what toll you take. Sing a file dig a die, go file dig a day. Father, father, my name is Bill. Out of each bushel I take a jill. Not enough, not enough, the old man said. I'm such a little, you'll never get ahead. Called to him his second son, said, Son, oh son, my race is run. If I miller of you make, pray tell me what toll you take. Sing a foul dig a die, go foul dig a day. Father, father, my name is Ralph. Out of each bushel I take half. Not enough, not enough, the old man cries. On such a little you'll never get a rise. Sing a foul dig a die, go foul dig a day. He called him his youngest son, said, Son, oh son, my race is run. If I miller of you make, 
Pray tell me what toll you take. Sing a fall dig a die go fall dig a day. Father, oh Father, my name is Paul. Out of each bushel I'd take all. Hallelujah, the old man cried. Then he kicked up his toes and died. Sing a fall dig a die go fall dig a day. They buried him in a new pine grave. Some do not think his soul to save. Where he went, I really don't know, but I rather think he went the other way. Let's have a wild welcome for Tina Sweet. And up next, if Bobby Miller is here, I don't see Bobby. Then next would be Amelia Sidlowski. Yay, Tina! So I didn't so much tie into the theme, although. I, I could have stretched it some warped way and connected it, but I am going to read a couple of things that I wrote. Um, so. This is my second time here. And I think I'm addicted to it already, just hearing everyone's different entertainment. So, Okay. Louder. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, this mic is the one that amplifies. Oh, and that's the tone. And that one is for the. Uh, okay. Great. Right. Thank you. Okay. Now I hear me too. Okay. So the two things that I'm reading um, are involve my grandparents in some way. So the first is my mother's mother, um, who was a school marm sort of person and taught for years and years and used to make beautiful quilts. And I have one of hers, and as does my sister. So um, this is called The Quilt. The wind howls outside my bedroom window as it relieves the trees of the last of their leaves. There's a feeling of comfort lying here beneath my grandmother's quilt. The nif nippy November night on one side, my sleepy body warm and secure on the other. She's been gone for almost nine years now, having lived for nearly 90. Her hand-stitched quilt made of cotton, thread, and batting remains as, perfect, remains as a perfect example that the whole is so much greater than the sum of its parts. Scraps of fabric from my grandmother's sewing, salvaged, snipped, and stitched, transformed into a garden of 12 petaled flower blossoms with yellow clusters. I lie beneath these stemless, floating flowers, and my attention is drawn to one of the petals on my left shin. There, I see my grandfather, smartly dressed in his yellow, red, and blue plaid golf pants, or slacks, as my grandmother used to call them. On my right knee sits my grandmother, needle and thread in hand, sporting her favorite house coat, a light blue flowery number. Just above and a bit to the right of my elbow, the cat is curled up on the lap of a pale yellow seersucker skirt. My grandparents' war wardrobe is not the only seed that has been sown in this heirloom garden, for memories bloom within every blossom their sweet fragrance lingering just above my bed. Sometimes at night, my soul strolls among the rows and picks a bouquet to place upon the heart's mantle. Once, it occurred to me that sleeping under these remnants of my grandparents' clothes felt a little like hiding beneath their laundry pile. 
I giggled at this thought, realizing that my grandmother, a retired 1940s school teacher, would have scolded me good and proper had she found me there. She wasn't one to put up with any shenanigans. I gathered the quilt around me tighter so she wouldn't hear my laughter. She wasn't really the cuddly sort. I wondered if years of teaching school had taught her to be so firm with children that she didn't often give herself permission to show affection. It occurs to me now that this beautiful quilt enveloping me was created by a woman who had kept her loved ones at arm's length most of her life. Could it possibly be that she made this quilt to share the love and affection that her own heart could not express? Maybe she had intended for it to embrace and comfort us in the way that she herself could not. <clears throat> snuggled, snuggled under the weight of the quilt, I cannot even begin to imagine how many stitches serve to root these flowers in their bed and mine. Over the years, the quilt has uprooted, has been uprooted and has traveled from my grandparents' bed to my mom's bed and to my own. Though many years have passed, the threads have held tight even where the fabric has long since worn away, the stitches remain, anchoring the outside edge of a colorful scrap to the quilt. A simple piece of thread stitching together an entire lifetime of memories, every seam securing the past to the present. My eyes grow heavy as I drift towards sleep. My grandfather yawns as he shuffles down the highway in his gray striped pajamas, maroon robe, and brown leather slippers. Yes, I already brushed, I tell my grandmother. I feel her kiss my cheek and watch her pink quilted bathrobe with the sparkling rhinestone buttons merge with the darkened room and as my, as my soul flings back the covers to frolic among the flowers. Thank you. Thank you. I have like a 30 seconds or no? Oh, 30 seconds. Is that okay? <laughs> it's about, yeah, it's okay. I'll, I'll read it really quick. We do the five minutes, I think you're fine. Okay. Um, so this is about um, a grandparent on the other side of the family. This is my father's grandfather. So it's my great grandfather, um, whose name was George Sweet. Everyone called him Pop Sweet. He was an old time fiddler and um, square dance caller all over Berkshire County and into New York and Connecticut. Um, his granddaughter, my great aunt, lived to nearly 100. So I spent a lot of time with her. And she had this scrapbook that she and her father, my great grandfather, put together. And I, she would get it out and it would transform her into being that little girl again. So. He played a lot of dances, and she attended most of them, and I got a lot of her wild stories of when she was younger. So this is great-grandfather's scrapbook, a poem for his daughter. So it's actually speaking to her. You open the brown leather cover, and your father squints and rubs the dusty dark from his eyes. There he stands, fiddle in hand, and as you begin to tell his tale, I swear I hear the Virginia reel spill out into the room. With a quivering hand, you point at the page while your frail voice fills in the lyrics to the dance. Oh, how you loved the dance. Swing her in the middle and kiss her if you dare. Your cane keeps the beat while your clouded eyes follow your heart's lead across the floor. You no longer notice his faded newsprint suit or the curled yellow tape at the edge of his left shoulder. You hear only the song, feel only the dance, know only this moment. Thank you. Thank you. So the theme, as you may have guessed, is what's cooking? And I brought my kitchen timer just because I love this. I've had it so long, it, it's broken, it fell apart so many times. I'm not going to use it to time everyone for the five minutes because it makes a horrible sound. 
But I can say on the back burner is Linda K. Moses. And coming up next, let's give a warm welcome to Amelia Sadlowski. <laughs> Tall enough for this? <laughs> you are hey, tall. There we go. Oh, that's lovely. Hi there. And what does this one do? That's for the TV. That's for the CTSB. Okay. Hi, Good. Thank you. Yeah, hi everyone. It's, oh God. You know, it's raining and I didn't want to go here. I didn't want to take out and go in the, and it's foggy. But once I get in this room with all of you, yeah. everything shifts, yeah. you know? The love is here. We belong with each other. It's just quite wonderful. Thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, my five minutes. Ah. <laughs> Most of you know I had a restaurant in New York City in the West Village, and I taught myself how to cook and bake, and I was really good at it, but I used the cookbook. I used the, what is it, the New York Times cookbook. And it was really great, you know? And I, I was very specific, and I did a great job. So comes Christmas time, mm -hmm. I'm like 25, and I have kids working for kids, right? What, they're 23 maybe? <laughs> so, <laughs> but they're, one's from the Midwest and one is from Florida. And every weekend I would go up to Woodstock or Bearsville with my friend Raj Harp, and uh, he had a house there, and then I would take off and do my thing. Um, so anyway, I asked if it would be all right if we went up there, I'd get a turkey and we'd come up and have a, you know, Christmas dinner. Tell you the truth, I don't remember ever buying anything more than the turkey. <laughs> you know, there was no mashed potatoes, there were no string beans, there were no, none of that. But I'm going to do a good thing and bring them up there and get them out of the city for the weekend. and. Um, so that was the plan. So I go to the, we stop at the market and I get a turkey and it's frozen solid. And you know, the giblets are frozen and stuck inside the cavity, right? And um, so, uh, but I was so concerned about botulism. So I made sure that it stayed safe somewhere in the trunk, frozen <laughs> <laughs> and frozen. So anyway, I, uh, we drive up to Woodstock, and um, I take it out. I think I put it in the fridge when we got there. This is like Christmas Eve. We're going to eat Christmas dinner. So, um, hmm. so anyway, um, as time is going by, oh, and Christmas morning, I realize it's still hard as a rock you know, including the giblets. And so uh, I don't know what to do because I'd never done a turkey before. So it's, it's like I was guessing. And my ego was such that I would never ask anyone, you know. So anyway, I take the turkey out of the refrigerator, put it on a tray, and sit it on a little bench in front of the fireplace, figuring that would help it to frost, you know, fast enough. Uh, about two o'clock, I found it wasn't happening. You know, it's still whatever. So into the oven it went with a, with a bunch of bacon strips on top. And um, yeah. <laughs> so I thought it would, you know, that's one way of doing it. And uh, time goes by and everyone's hungry and there's nothing happening. And then the bacon disappears and then there's, you know, we got to find more bacon to put on top. Uh, I don't, this is one of my um, cringe moments, this whole thing. You know, I thought I was doing such a good thing. And we're all smoking weed and we're all drinking whatever. And so, you know, part of us isn't really present for anything. And um, so I don't remember when we ate, if we ate. <laughs> Whatever happened to that turkey, I had no clue. Um, 
my intention was good, but, and I didn't have the stuff to go with it that I remember. I didn't have, ba you know, potatoes or any of those things. So I don't know. They might have gone somewhere else for dinner. I have not a clue. Um, but that was my, that was my first turkey dinner, and I'll, I'll learn a lot of lessons from it. Um, and I've sent many apologies to these kids for, you know, but I don't think they cared, you know. <laughs> they were so high, they didn't, they didn't bother anybody. So anyway, that was my um, what's cooking. And I think I'll stop here because I'm pushing it. On board is Jennifer Clark, and up next, let's welcome Linda K. Moses. Yay. I think this is the right height. So, so um, last time I was here, which was just last month, I read a segment of a short story and I was asked to come back and read some more of it. So those of you who might have been here might recall that the story was about a woman who um, lived on Utopia Parkway. So this story is called Utopia Parkway and she was thought of by the people in her neighborhood as a witch. Well, be that as it may. We ended with a discussion about her house. The property extended from the edge of the parkway to the end of a long alley of crooked apple trees that had been part of the family's original orchard behind the cottage. Between the trees were the flower and herb gardens with orange poppy, purple iris, <clears throat> blue hydrangea, and some raucous azaleas at the back that had been planted all over the area during the Japanese macraze in the 1900s. There are also some native milkweed for the butterflies and wild daisies, violets that spread throughout the garden, and goldenrod because they just wanted to be there. Everything bloomed in its own season. So the back area was never free of the perfume of at least one blossoming plant. There was no room for a lawn, since between all the flowers there were herbs, lavender, chamomile, and mint for serenity and sleep, oregano, marjoram, thyme, basil for flavor, and some ginger and fennel thrown in for good measure and good health. The outside of the house itself was a wonder. It was so thoroughly covered by a centuries-old wisteria, a single vine, tree-like in its age, that the siding was almost invisible, and sections of the, wine, the vine had to be tenderly removed from around the windows for light and fresh air to enter. It had been planted in Japan, uprooted, and then carried from Europe and then to America with a care that reflected how precious it was to its bearer. At the end of every winter, before there was any evidence that the wisteria had survived the bitter nights and gray days clothed in frozen rain or snow, Antoinette walked around her house, caressing each cane and shoot of the brave vine, at least those that she could reach thanking it for its past flowerings and encouraging it to bloom vigorously in the coming seasons. Apparently it listened, for it bloomed every year for many more months than might have been expected, and its limbs always drooped with huge lavender flowers that threatened to overweigh the branches that valiantly tried to support them. The perfume of its blossoms spread all the way past Union Turnpike and north to fresh meadows, throughout the freshly cut lawns of Jamaica estates, and even south into Hollis. In the thick haze of humid summer days, it lingered 
and was carried beyond the borders of Queens by the fierce traffic nearby on Grand Central Parkway to finally confuse those out in the Hamptons who had ordered rare rose bushes and wondered if their gardeners had planted something else by mistake when they could not find any trace of a rosy aroma even in the hot descending dusk of the day. Such was the intensity of the wisteria's scent. It awakened senses that had been blurred by the six thick city air, reminding all who breathed it of a time in their past when their dreams were pure and simple and anything was possible. And so they took ever deeper breaths, finding release from the day and its many adversities. They often found themselves stopping in mid-stride on the streets to take even deeper breaths, causing impatient drivers to honk repeatedly, urging them to continue crossing the busy avenues. Every blossom swarmed with sun-warmed bees who were seduced by the perfume and thrived on the pollen, enveloping the shrub with a murmuring and billowing mist. Even though this marvel of a shrub grew to surround her pale yellow Dutch door, Antoinette never was afraid of being stung by the bees who were so besotted by the wisteria and seemed equally so by her. They never, in all the days down the long years of her presence, had wounded her. This was not so for any religionists who dared uninvited to approach this vine cottage. When they arrived, waving the exclusionary pamphlets and mouthing their misguided theories Antoinette despised, the bees were quick to remind them they were unwelcome. They swarmed around the heads of these arrogant invaders, flying into their ears and mouths, tangling in their hair as well, but avoiding stinging them, for Antoinette murmured to them not to sacrifice themselves on the altar of her private distaste. These men, for they were mostly men, retreated, stumbling down the stony path to the curb of Utopia Parkway, waving their pamphlets around and above their heads as they tripped over the uneven steps, and turning once as they left to see the soft, smiling face of Antoinette watching them from the op upper opening of the front door. To get back to the children, though, they were, you might say, equally as entranced as the bees, except for the very few who were, even so early in their lives, given to a surprising and indigestible skepticism. Children, most of them accept en enchantment willingly and while the, without even a dollop of doubt, though there are always some who do not. The latter did not find Antoinette's classes the slightest bit interesting at first, but their mothers insisted beyond all their resistance that they attend each class <clears throat> without fail. Those few would initially sit sullenly in the back row of the chairs in Antoinette's study, but would ultimately catch the spark of her love for the music, about which she was extraordinarily passionate and knowledgeable and quite good at sharing this passion with all of the children. She gave all of herself to them, surrounding the children not just with the music itself, which she played on an old turntable, I'm getting to the food, believe me, but also sharing the poetry for when the music had been composed, often reading it in the language of the poet, revealing the music hidden in the words before translating it. She reminded them each time the children arrived that they were to listen to the music not just with their ears but with their hearts as well, to let it flow around and through them. And she would ask them to imagine what they would see if the music suddenly appeared as something they could see as well as hear. Once the children had been seated, she appeared from her dressing room in original garments whose worth was incalculable that were appropriate for the period of the composer whose music she was sharing with the children. Truth be told, the clothing was actually of the period and not reproduced for Antoinette, so old that all of it had been repaired and restored by Nayanya herself more times than could be counted, lest some strange seamstress damage them with inappropriate stitching or patching. 
When Antoinette presented Beethoven's music to the children, for example, she wore all the layered silks, laces, and trains that the fashions of the 18th century demanded of women. Though her long white hair remained piled high, with several curls escaping on each side of her rouged cheeks, skipping the weeks that were common during that time. She spoke of Beethoven's daily rituals, his composing, his loss of hearing, and other aspects of the life of a composer in that century. This would even include small details of his favorite food. I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but we really only have five minutes. Oh dear. And everyone gets just five minutes, so okay. I don't think you realize that. It's such an engaging story. Yeah. You're going to, yeah, you know, I see that there's more. I'm so Two sorry. Two more paragraphs, okay. short ones. Food. Should we? What should we do? Yes. What shall, we, what shall I do? I'm fine with what everyone wants. You know, there's many people. Uh, okay. It's, it's hard. It really okay. It's challenging. It's not a problem. Yeah. Thank you for that beautiful story. And I, I, it's hard for me in this position to pull the, you know, whatever that's called, the hook. It's like five minutes each is our um, agreement. And maybe I didn't say that uh, strongly enough in the beginning, because it's a challenge when you have a lot to read. So up next is Jennifer Clark. And before I, I want to say on the back burner is Eileen Weiss. So welcome. Let's give a big welcome to Jennifer. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here standing in front of this exquisite backdrop. And the man who made it is very modest, but he's standing right over there. Um, and I got an email from him today saying there would be a keyboard on stage, thanks to his uh, lovely son who played at the open house. Did anyone get to it earlier this year? or? in December, yeah, must have been wonderful. So I'm going to use it to play a composition I wrote that is dedicated to the people of Ukraine. And that's it, thank you.
you. I'd like to apologize to Eileen. Her name is Eileen Marcus. Next up, Eileen Marcus. And, <laughs> and on board is Deborah Macheski. It always started the same way. She'd take her apron off the hook. She wouldn't put it over her hat, but she'd take the apron off her hook and she'd tie it behind her back and she'd take out her wand. And then she would dance. Arabesque to the refrigerator, plie to the oven, twirl to the garbage, varnishing, or whatever that word is, her magic wand to make things happen. My grandmother grew up on the border of Italy, that's Italy, she didn't grow up in Italy, she was Jewish. She grew up on the border of Germany and Poland. And you wouldn't say that too. She grew up on the border of Germany and Poland and on the outskirts and she knew how to take really tough cuts of meat and really brown and you know dirty root vegetables and make delicious delicacies. There were no cookbooks, there were no recipes. There was her ability to doctor it. In her broken Yiddish, not Italian, she would say, doctor it, make it better, fix it, like when you go to the doctor, doctor it. So we would fix the recipes, a little salt, a little pepper, her unexpected cinnamon, sometimes a little squeeze of an orange, and I followed her, and I learned, and I became a cook. I think mostly because she would give me a taste of everything, and I like to eat, so I followed her around, took nibbles, and would taste the food at each stage, so I knew what it tasted like and I became a pretty good cook. There were no recipes, and some things I did not learn. Her pea soup is lost forever. Eileen, I love, put it in a little cup. That's too much, too much barley. No wonder you have no water, Eileen, I love. Put the, the kosher salt around the onion, then you know it's around the onion. Some things did not travel well, and some recipes were lost, but mostly I cook like my grandmother. That is in stark contrast to my ex, emphasis on the word ex, mother-in-law, who was Israeli, a Sabra, and did everything by the book, you know, as if she was launching Israeli missiles, you know, <laughs> jumping out of a plane, what is it, checklist, the brisket, the scallions, the red wine, the garlic, and she would give me recipes, and I would follow them, and they would never come out good, no matter how much I tried to doctor, I couldn't do it. I was married to her only son, I wanted to make him happy. Once, twice, ten times, the recipes weren't coming out until she gave me a cookie recipe. And I realized, there's no leavening agent. This cookie is not going to rise. My ex-law had been harpooning my efforts. And, you know, when it was a nice pilaf and you forgot a little garlic, it didn't matter. But in a cookie, boy, did it matter. I did not follow her recipes any longer. But none of them, none of them could hold a candle to the legend. Cousin Ethel. I cannot really tell you how she was related to me. We called her, her mother, Mo Mama, which in Yiddish was more mama, because she was another mama. I think she was just um, a cousin or a distant relative when my grandmother came here all alone, you know, became friends with that family and got to know them. And Cousin Ethel became the legend for Cousin Ethel's potatoes. Mashed potatoes, whipped and mashed with those onion rings, I don't know if they were turkey at the time, and they're not sponsoring me to say it, but those turkey onion rings, crushed in, put with, we didn't use butter, we were kosher, a lot of margarine on the pan, the potatoes mixed in with the onions on top, another layer of margarine, so it poofed. And me and my sisters, three sisters, who never agreed on anything, agreed on those mashed potatoes, Cousin Ethel's potatoes, we loved them. Our children loved them. Those of my sisters, I'm a little jealous of grandchildren, they love them. But me and my daughter, we make them for every holiday and everybody asks for them. A few years ago, well, a few now, like 20 years ago, right before Ethel died, I saw her and I said, Ethel, you really made an impact on our life. Those potatoes, no matter what I cook, are the best. And she goes, what potatoes? What are you talking about? You know, Ethel lived in the big house, the big car. You know, she, Ethel had made it. I don't cook, I went around. I don't cook, I, I don't. We came that night for Shabbat Din, you made a soup. Ah, I kind of remember you. I made them once, and your mother asked for the recipe. Uh -huh. So Cousin Ethel's potatoes that she made once 
are a legend in my family. <laughs> so what's the moral of the story? Share your recipes, people. Share your recipes. And you will live forever in other people's stomachs. <laughs> Thank you. Jedediah and Annie are on board. And Deborah Macheski. Is Deborah here? I don't see her. So up next, Jedediah and Annie. Let's give them a warm welcome. <laughs> With tunnel vision, in darkness, came the light from a dream. First, just the subtle sound of a trickle of water, its noise increasing as I saw the shapes of the stones polished to roundness from the floor. It moved around them in a perfection of curves, falling from one tier to the next, creating the bubbles of a crystalline foam. From this, she began to rise. With sunlight now piercing a canopy of greenery, a glimmering silhouette began to take hold. Though I could see the movement of shimmering lips, the tones of the voice came from within myself. Within them came the memories from the vagueness of time past. I began to see them gathering in concentric circles around her, and with her gaze fixed directly upon me. She said, call me by my name. In an instant, I was within the circle, a song moving amongst us in a swirl. With a faintness, it seemed familiar until its sound began to fill me, its rise stroking the chords of my voice as it passed, bringing with it remembrance. From the pool of water came the reflection, yeah, Uh, okay. <laughs> it's rise, <laughs> stroking the chords She's stories of, of my voice as it passed, bringing with it remembrance. And the trees were giant From the pool of water came the reflection of a child. When our eyes met, it was a clear image of self. In a way, the lessons came back. The teachings of all I was to need to know. The thoughts of which brought a fullness to my spirit. Though just behind them, I remembered the fear. All the uncertainty, the questions of why me. When I turned with discomfort, her image was still before me, now clear to see. I sensed her role in raising me as I began to weep. She smiled broadly, embracing me with an energy that brought warmth. And she said, remember who you are.
came and asked her why. Now she cries and she counts the years that have gone by since the starry, starry child came and asked her. It's a real melting pot we have here, <laughs> all different flavors. A short poem called Just Enough, soil for legs, X for hands, flower for eyes, bird for ears, mushrooms for nose, smile for mouth, songs for lungs, sweat for skin, and wind for mind. That's by Nanai Sakaki. And next we have coming up, Steve Mole. And on board will be Sonia Pilser. Let's welcome Steve. Hi. Hi. So I'm going to sing a song if you couldn't tell. Um, I'm going to sing the song I was going to sing last month, but I wasn't here, so I'm going to sing it this month. It's about someone coming home, coming home, it could be a man or a woman, or, and um, it talks about a train station. I'm from Pittsfield, and they tore the Pittsfield train station down during urban renewal back in the 60s, so this part's not really true, but then I had three verses written and I was walking my favorite trail at the State Forest, Pittsfield State Forest. I was standing by a brook, and then I turned around and a branch brushed my cheek, and that's going to be the fourth verse. <laughs> this is called um, Memories in a Dream. Stepping off this evening train In my old hometown Walking through these old stone halls Train station still standing tall Snow is falling light tonight On this Christmas Eve And footprints fade with every breath like memories in a dream hear the sound of music from the avenue they say you play most every night that old town hall it'd be worth any price just to hear you sing it's been a year since i've heard your voice even from afar so sing sweet angel sing 
Sing your winter song Sing sweet angel Sing your songs of peace I won't bother walking through that open door I can see your face, I can hear your voice once more Just to know that you are safe on this winter's night it's enough to bring me peace on this Christmas Eve, so sing, sweet angel, sing your winter song. Sweet angel, sing your songs of peace. Standing by this open brook on this cold, cold dawn, the sound of rushing water reflects the spring to come brushing branch against my cheek reminds me where i am in the arms of nature with a thankful heart so sing sweet angel Sing your winter song Sing, sweet angel Sing your songs of peace Stepping off this evening train In my old hometown Walking through these old stone halls Train stations still standing tall Snow is falling light tonight On this Christmas Eve Footprints fade with every breath like memories in a dream Yes, footprints fade with every breath Like memories in a dream <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. On deck is Kristen Grippo. And let's give a warm welcome to Sonia Pilser. Hi, it's great to be here. Okay, what's cooking is that it's a new year and I'm going to come clean. This is my New Year's confession. I smoke. Marijuana, that is. <laughs> Cannabis. What I call dope. But that's muy ultra and politically incorrect. It's pejorative. I guess the reference to being stupid, a dope, not very flattering. Weed is the word. But who cares about the confession of my secret vice held tightly in the dark caverns of my heart? Once people were busted. Who remembers Midnight Express? What does it mean now in a world of theory wellness, 
Canna, Calix, The Pass, Farnsworth, Divine, Rebel, etc. Recently, a young bartender offered to sell me what Bob Marley smoked when he wrote his music. I was at the center of Jewish history on West 16th Street to hear a Polish archivist artist talk about the mostly unknown and uncredited Jewish women resistors and fighters during the Holocaust. I wandered outside the room, glanced at the exhibit about Emma Lazarus, but I was not ready for what I saw when I turned the corner, the story of Jews and cannabis with a large black and white image of Allen Ginsberg holding a sign, pot is a reality kick. <laughs> Nearby was a photo of a furious Nixon. You know, it's a funny thing. Every one of the bastards that are out there for legalizing marijuana is Jewish. What the Christ is the matter with Jews, Bob? What is the matter with them? I suppose it's because most of them are psychiatrists. <laughs> The exhibit title, Am Yisrael Chai, is a play on the Hebrew dictum, Am Yisrael Chai, the people of Israel lives. There are hundreds of books, articles, photographs, and modern artifacts, including a marijuana Seder plate, a glass menorah bong, and a shofar pipe. I swear. Nearby, in a section, Cannabis in Ancient Israel, there's an old drawing of Kaner Bosem, translated as fragrant reed, which was found in the residue of an altar from 3rd century BCE. Is there something Jewish about getting high? I didn't really smoke in college. Part became a part of my life in my late 20s when I took a writing workshop with a famous writer. Before the class began, I joined my teacher in the back room where he lit a joint. Other students came in. It was the 70s. He would then conduct the class brilliantly as always, sometimes a little outrageously, but that was his style. He championed my first novel and turned me on to his agent. So I got the idea that creativity, specifically writing, could be augmented with a puff or two. Not all the time, not get wrecked, just slightly lubricated. And it often worked, releasing me from some demons or telling them at least to shove off so I could get some work done. And I did get my work done. But I paid the price of secrecy. I didn't want my colleagues or students to know. What would they think of me if they knew I met my dealer inside of his Volvo and bought an ounce? People were getting busted. The Rockefeller laws raged for decades. And as archivist and organizer Eddie Portnoy states, it would be a very different show if it was Latins and cannabis or blacks and cannabis. Astronomer Carl Sagan is quoted in the exhibit. Marijuana, quote, helps produce the serenity, insight, sensitivity, and fellowship so desperately needed in this increasingly mad and dangerous world. I agree. My other thought, if you live long enough or just a few decades, you will see everything change. I used to think it was pathetic when old people like me, talked about how you could take the subway for a nickel. Uh, hey, I remember when you could buy a token for 15 cents, and then it went up to a quarter. Then there were no more tokens. I'm trying to be comfortable with change. Loose change? Hey, what's that? Who uses cash anyway? Or as Buddhists say, all that exists is impermanent. Nothing stays the same. Get used to it. <laughs> Christina Coldus on deck. And next, Kristen Grippo. Yay! Hello. I, I just think um, the grandmothers are here tonight. I, 
I tried to not, with the theme, like I tried to not tell a story about my grandmother, but that was not the message I got. So, <laughs> um, and it, she is uh, the Italian grandma. So, <laughs> so, um, so my niece gave me a picture of my grandma Lucy recently. Um, probably it's like the mid '90s, and she's it's when she lived with us. I was in high school, and she's standing by the stove, and she has a she's got salt and pepper hair, and a fabulous like black and white sweater, and stirrup pants with like little grandma heels <laughs> and she's beaming and she's got like a wooden spoon in her hand and uh, there and there's a magnet on the fridge that actually says Lucy's kitchen and even though it's my mother's Geraldine's kitchen but it was Lucy's kitchen and um, and there's like you know I inspected it and it's so it's so funny it we try you try to go like this but it's actually just a photograph so I can't zoom in um, you know and there's some like chopped meat being probably not meatballs but she's probably gonna cook some maybe like a marinara sauce or something and um, it's that picture of Grandma Lucy has just been sitting on ab above my sink when I look out the window and do the dishes and so she's been like coming through real strong and. Um, my grandmother was the first American-born baby. Um, her, her parents came from outside of Naples, a town called Vesuvio, and so she was born on 50 Mott Street in Chinatown. She was very proud of that. And, uh, and all three of my great-grandparents were, um, were born in Italy, and, my, and her husband, my grandfather, was born there as well. And so I've always, I've always identified strongly as an Italian-American, and, uh, and growing up as a kid, we we ate differently. Um, my my Jewish best friend, they made like sloppy Joe. Her mother made sloppy Joes and tacos and like Amer. Like I I really would call. I used to call it American food, um, because my family was different. And um, you know the whole every cliche. It's a cliche because it's true, right? Like our language was food. Just that's what it was and how it is still and um, you know like on Sundays we had the, the the pasta and then the meat and then the salad at the end usually with oranges and fennel um, still so good and um, and through the years uh, my mother and grandmother you know uh, it was peasant food and so they would try to get me to eat all kinds of weird things. Um, I remember biting into like a particularly soft piece of breaded chicken cutlet that I later found out was cow's tongue. Um, and uh, and in particular, I remember I can picture my grandmother standing in that same spot in front of the stove, uh, pulling up uh, a big piece of tripe from the from the pot, which is cow's stomach, if you don't know. Um, and you know, it actually, it's, it's kind of beautiful. It's got this really like intricate, like uh, diamond pattern, but it looks like a rubbery, stretchy thing. And uh, they would make it with in tomato sauce. And uh, I, my grandmother would sort of, I remember her showing me and sort of laughing at my recoiling. And you don't know what's good for you, this kid. She doesn't know what's good for her, you know? Um, and and I did I really didn't but um when I, and they would lament because when I was a baby I would I would pick the chicken hearts out of the soup um, and I would e you know eat the the galamada the calamari um, as the lay people say um, you know right right out of the salad and then from age five to twenty five I just didn't eat seafood much to my <laughs> dismay um, and uh, all those years I didn't get to eat the yeah the squid and the the tentacles and things and. Um, yeah, and so, so fast forward to like a couple years ago. I don't know if she's still there, but there was this wonderful Mexican woman in Great Barrington who made burritos. Um, is she still there? She's in the atrium, like down um, where steam used to be. And so, so many a couple years ago, I was uh, waiting uh, this woman to meticulously prepare like awesome burrito and I, I always welcome an opportunity to, to practice my Spanish and whenever you can whenever someone can speak in their native tongue I think it's um, such a beautiful opening into connection and 
Um, so I'm waiting and I'm chatting her up and I find out, and she's very much seems like a little grandmother. And, um, and I actually, I find out she's from Mexico City. She specific, I said, Mexico where? She said, the city, like mm-hmm. done, you know? In the same way, growing up on Long Island, the city was the city. And there's no, it's what you say. And um, so she, I said, oh, do you make any traditional foods? And in fact, she had on the pot, in the, because she doesn't eat burritos all day, um, she had something cooking on the stove. Um, so she offers me um, a little, one of those plastic cups that's usually reserved for sour cream or guacamole, uh, a little taste of something. And, um, and I, I see that it's something from like 11th grade Spanish comes up and I'm like, oh, menudo, I think that's what this is. It's this traditional Mexican soup. And it's red and thin, and it's got a little oil on the top. Um, and as I'm sitting there chatting with her, I'm like looking at it, and I'm, think, I'm thinking about Grandma Lucy. And the way that um, Lucy, the way that she ate, um, was with such love and gusto. Like she would, you know, have no problem picking up and draining the bowl um, because that's where all the vitamins are. <laughs> um, that's what's good for you, you know. Um, and and she would she would beam when I did the same if I would take my bread and like sop up from the lentils and the pasta, and um, and just again I, I think like feeling feeling from so many of you all tonight like that our mothers and our grandmothers like here and present and like um, for me just just. Yeah, just wanting to see us thrive, truly. Um, and so I, I look at this cup and I see there's like a little chunk of white something in it. And I like immediately realize like, oh, that's a piece of tripe. <laughs> so what else could I do? I downed it. And I know then and now my grandmother is saying, oh, this kid finally knows what's good for her. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I can't help but mention my Italian grandmother, Rosaria Dolce, from Montemaggiore. And she, the story goes, she would knit with chicken bones. I don't know if that's true, but she made her own pasta and laid it on the bed to dry, right? And she always had a dented pot in the fridge full of escarole and beans. And the other thing to remember is February 3rd, I think, is St. Lucy, uh, the feast where Chichiri, they would cook the chickpeas, and they represented her eyes. I don't want to go into that story about her martyrdom and and what happened. But so let's keep moving forward with what's cooking. We have got Christina Coldis up next, but on board is Julia Erickson. So welcome, Christina. I said. uh, Okay, I said. uh, uh, this is a starry song. Um, you can. I want to write a children's book and put a CD in the back so the kid can sing the song and the book will be read. Well, long story short, here I am singing the song to you, <laughs> my children, and my grandkids. <sighs> a little nervous because I haven't practiced it as much as I would like to. One more thing. Would you like me to hold that? No, I might do it this way. Okay. 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 I'm sorry. I've used up four minutes already. Oh boy. Got my glasses on, I'm ready. And I can't believe there's another auto harp in this room. Hey! I have a brother out here. Okay. This is called Toby's Dreamland Ride. I have a dog named. Toby, upon him I do ride Through silver clouds and moonbeams Travel side by side Every night we venture To places near and far Touch mountaintops and moonbeams And rest upon the stars Oh, 
she told me where to take me. She, I wish you would. I've been home all day long, and I promise I'll be good. We talked to magic fairies and listened to the tales of pirate ships that treasure hunt seven seas they sail. They told the knights and ladies that live in castles high about the mighty dragon that soars across the sky. You know, you can sing the chorus, oh, told me when to take me, told me can I come, will I through dreamland, oh, to the morning sun, told me will you take me, gee, I wish you would, I've been home all day long. They tell kings and princes their royal kingdoms too of unicorns, magic frogs that lived inside a shoe. They tell of ghosts and goblins seen when the moon is bright, of gnomes and elves and leprechauns that visit through the night. Don't Just as I get sleepy and I know we cannot stay, they sprinkle us with stardust, send us on our way to dreamland we do travel and sleep till the rising sun lights the sky with morning and our dreamland ride is done. Tony, will you take me? Tony, can I come? We'll ride through a dreamland the morning sun. Oh, Tony, will you take me? Tony, can I come? Oh, yeah. I've been home all day long, and I promise I I'll be good. piece a while ago, but I've never actually performed it or recited it, shall we say. <clears throat> the cake incident. One narrow, hollowed out log still burns. Soon there will be only ashes. The evening behind me consisted of a woman, a man, and the cake incident. <laughs> I wanted to say something. Should I say something? No, it's not my place to say something. But will I merely sit here, just sit here, quietly observing this cake incident that will surely be famous one day? Shall I just sip my coffee with cream and wait for my own piece of cake to arrive? It was, well, he wanted cake with his coffee. She glared and said, can't you just wait? There is a certain pace to a meal that one should be aware of. But I want my cake now, he said. Why should that make any difference to you? Well, it does, but have cake then, she said, and rose to get the cake. But wait, I'll get it myself, he said. No, 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 no. I will get it. And then I heard some drawers open and close very quickly, forks and spoons and knives jumping from their own compartments into other compartments, and cupboards squeak and bam, and plates ready to be or already chipped on the edges as they are roughly grabbed and slammed down onto the countertop. 
The log has just split into two, and the brightest flame burns out of the ashes. I heard the knife cut into the cake. Okay, well, not the cake exactly. Actually ripping through, scratching the bottom of the 9 by 12 inch baking pan. And he, who had been standing all the while in disbelief, or was it mock disbelief, between the kitchen entrance and the fireplace and the Indian rug and the cups of coffee and me, finally returned to his place. We sat in silence watching the fire burn. It was quite ablaze by this time. And then she arrived with pieces of cake on very nice and glass and clear dessert plates. Forks rattled and spun and wanted to jump off onto our laps, but then they rested. There was silence. He took a bite of his cake and said, by the way, the cake is good. She said nothing. <laughs> so let's give a big round of welcome to Jeannie Bassus. So hi, happy new year everybody. I've told this story at IWOW years ago, but I'll say it one more time. I've said it more than once. Years and years ago, I was at a New Year's Eve party, and at the time, my friend's daughter, who was like two, thought everybody was saying, Happy New You, Happy New You. <laughs> so Happy New You. Um, I didn't really do the theme, but I realized in a way I kind of did, which is what's cooking is I thought I would tell you all kind of my learning edge when I'm learning a new song. And this is a song that I've known my whole life that I probably played a few times, you know, along with other people or somewhere once I had the chords to it. But it was like one of my best friends said to me, hey, do you know how to play this song the other day? And I went, well, I have played it, but I'll learn it. So what I did was I took well, first I went to Rise Up Singing. Lots of you know that book, Rise Up Singing, which has horrible, it's horrible to read it the way the chords are. They make up words that I don't like sometimes. And, and the chords weren't working for me anyway. So that was my first step. Then I, of course, Googled the song, which um, I won't be in a big mystery about. It's called Stew Ball. Some of you might know it. Um, I know it from Peter, Paul, and Mary from when I was a kid, and also Joan Baez did a version. Woody Guthrie did it. It's, I think it would be considered a traditional song. So like as many versions as you can imagine are probably out there. So then what I did was first I figured out which chords worked for me. Then I figured out which words of the different versions I wanted to do. Um, and I found out that Joan Baez's chords work better. And then um, Peter, Paul, and Mary's words felt better to me because they were the ones I knew better, I guess. But then it was, it's always the question of like, what do I do with the capo? Where do I, how do I figure out where to play it? And th that's my biggest growing edge. And I have this wonderful musical coach I've told you all about who helps me with my, my songs and singing and all that. And I would take the song to her and say, where do I play it? And she'd say to me, try different places and see what works. I can't hear what works. Try, you know, she'd be like, you can, you can learn to hear it. You can. So I'm not going to see her for another couple of weeks. So I figured this out and I don't know if it works. <laughs> <laughs> but if it doesn't, who cares? <laughs> Thank you. So, um, if you don't know this song, it's really easy. You can hum along, you can try the chorus. Oh, and the other thing that was sort of part of my process was whenever there's a song that I love for some reason or I feel like drawn to, kind of there's something compelling about it, it's almost always like, duh, it's a waltz. Almost every time. One, two, three. Like that, right? You know, and I could play like this for a while, but, you know, eventually I should start it, right? Oh, 
Stupo was a racehorse. Wait, I don't want to play with this on. Thank you. Oh, Stupo was a racehorse. And I wish he were mine. Do you know this? He never drank water. Oh, and I had to learn a new chord. D suspended fourth. D, D suspended fourth. He always drank wine. It would help if I played the right chords. We'll get there. His bridle was silver. His mane it was gold. His bridle was silver. His mane it was gold. And the worth of his saddle has never been told. And the worth of his saddle. Have never been told. Oh, the fairgrounds were crowded. Oh, the fairgrounds were crowded. Stubo was there. And Stubo was there. The betting was heavy on the gray and the mare. He was heavy on the bay and the mare. On the gray mare, I bet on the bay. I bet on the gray mare. I bet on the bay. If I bet on old Stu Ball, I'd be a rich man today. If I bet on old Stu Ball, I'd be a free man today. The turtle dove moans. Oh, the hoot owl she hollers. And the turtle dove moans. I'm a poor boy, bad poor boy in trouble, a long way from home. I'm a poor boy in trouble. I'm a long way from home. ahead of them all and away up yonder ahead of them all came a prancing and a dancing my noble steeple came a prancing and a dancing my noble steeple steeple was a racehorse I read this a few years ago, so I apologize if anybody remembers it. Anyone who has ever eaten a meal in my home knows that I am no cook. My George Foreman grill is as gourmet as I get. And yet one college summer, I managed to secure a position in the kitchen at an Italian seafood restaurant on the Jersey Shore, Long Beach Island to be exact. Oddly named the Blue Noodle, the restaurant was owned by Frank and Vicky Uzzolino. Vicky, who was as wide as she was tall, was a legendary cook. I still dream about her lasagna. Vicky took excessive pride in her kitchen, which was kept spotless. She would sometimes invite friends back to the kitchen after their meal for an impromptu inspection. You could eat off the floor, she'd like to boast, and she was right. Frank was terminally cranky and had chronically yelled for so many years that his voice was permanently hoarse. He never spoke in a conversational tone, but had a perpetual raspy stage whisper. He referred to me and the waitresses as lollipops. <laughs> never, 
Never before or since have I been called a lollipop. But I, but I believe it was his attempt at a term of endearment. <coughs> Frank had very little patience for the mishaps and aggravations that went along with restaurant ownership. He would frequently be ranting in his stage whisper at this or that culinary calamity. I remember him saying, Vicky, the shrimp went bad. What happened to the fucking shrimp? <laughs> Trouble was, there were people just on the other side of the kitchen door eating said shrimp. <laughs> Next thing we knew, the message would spread around the dining room like wildfire. Don't order the shrimp. There's something wrong with the shrimp. When I say I worked as a cook, I used the title very loosely. The truth is, my job was simply to throw Vicky's exquisitely cooked entrees into the oven and time them. The heat index in the kitchen usually hovered somewhere around 600 degrees. I would customarily sport a bandana on my head filled with ice, which would slowly melt dripping into my eyes as I slaved away prepping appetizers of Anapasto, Clams Casino, and Calamari. Occasionally, a sleek Cadillac or Lincoln Continental would glide silently past the restaurant windows and pull up to a stop at the front door, at which time Frank and Vicky would gather the staff together to inform us that family was here <coughs> and serving family at the Blue Noodle was deadly serious business. The presentation of the entrees had to be perfect, the service impeccable. Everything had to be just so. We were to bring out an extra antipasto or some of the good stuff a special vintage from Frank's wine collection. The kitchen and wait staff universally dreaded these family visits. Secret glances were exchanged that said, oh shit, I'm not up for this tonight. <laughs> there were nervous whispers in the kitchen as the evening wore on. Are these really Frank and Vicky's family? Or is it the mafia we're entertaining? Frankie's, Frank and Vicky's niece, Anna, would sometimes come for the weekend to make a little extra money. Anna scared the bejesus out of me. She was a tough cookie, muscular, with short spiked hair, city girl, born and raised in, the, raised in the Bronx, whereas I grew up on a sweet little road called Country Lane, which I realized gave me no street cred whatsoever. I also surmised that Anna could kick the living daylights out of me, so I gave her a wide berth. She was rumored to have hair on her chest, so the other waitresses were afraid to confront her when she took all the best tables. Blue Noodle Kitchen Code, make one false move and Anna will tear you to pieces. The walk-in freezer was a paradise of lemonade and cheesecake. And any time we needed to go to the freezer for something, we would put our mouths under the lemonade spigot and take a swig or stab out a piece of cheesecake. This would be dinner unless there were any mistakes incorrect entrees sent back to the kitchen untouched. Anything that came back to the kitchen was fair game. Every night we hoped there would be at least a few mistakes. It's embarrassing to be my age and to never have learned much in the way of cooking. Each New Year's I make some sort of resolution about cultivating more civilized ways of feeding myself. Sadly, the kitchen never was my natural habitat. I wish I knew any of Vicky's secret recipes or could recall how to properly prepare even one appetizer from my nights at the Blue Noodle. But what I do remember always makes me smile. Well, let's welcome Kitty. And after Kitty on board is the steward. sitting for such a long time. Um, okay. My dad was born in 1921 and was, among, among other skill sets, a singer. He loved any excuse to sing, harmony with others who sang and played acoustic instruments or solo. He knew the words to all the songs and ditties from the 30s, 40s, and 50s. When I was a kid, and while we did barn chores together, phrases could prompt outbursts of song. As his eyes twinkled, <clears throat> his smile was infectious. When Pearl Harbor was attacked, he was a sophomore at Duke. 
he and many other students enlisted. Dad chose the Navy. After midshipman school, when he was a second lieutenant, he shipped to San Diego and was staged and sent to war. The war, for him, was long periods of boredom interspersed with intense action. <clears throat> Being transported from San Diego at 13 knots took three to five weeks to get to Australia. Submarines were on the prowl, <clears throat> kamikazes a threat, and the losses were huge. But singing, friendship, short time in the States, and belief in the mission and discipline kept heart and spirit sustained. In my lifetime, Cole Porter's, hey, good looking, say, what's cooking? was an endless remembrance for dad with bubbles of joy and laughter. What's cooking? The song, when you read the lyrics, you walk in the sun with your buddies in your new uniform, which covers your beautiful fit body. You're 6'2 with blue eyes and, a, and st are strong jawed handsome. Long arms, a rower and a track star. So here, when there's a sun above, I always find romantic thoughts of love never enter my mind. But when the day is done, I find that instead, I just love everyone. And as Elizabeth Barrett Barning once said, hey, good looking, say, what's cooking? Do you feel like booking some fun tonight? Hey, 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 good looking. If you're not already tooken, could you meet me soon in the light of the moon? Hey, 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 good looking. Give in and we'll begin cooking that delish little dish called love. Your voice, Miss Ovaltine, has me impressed. You're the missing link between Lily Ponds and Mae West. But I must warn you, ma'am, if later you're free, I'm half wolf, my lamb. And as the famous Tallulah muttered to me, hey, good looking, say, what's cooking? Do you feel like booking some fun tonight? Hey, 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 good looking. If you're not already tooken, could you meet me soon in the light of the moon? Tonight. Mm -hmm. World War II, this was Cole Porter's song, and it was crooned. So hey, good looking, how's about me? Right now, tonight. Let's dance or sing and slip away in the moonlight because I'm gone tomorrow or the next day. That's my performance. But the footnote is, in 1951, we're probably all more familiar with Hank Williams' version of this, which is a little bit more, you know, my dog just died and I have a flat tire. Um, <laughs> but um, I really, I'm a Cole Porter fan. And so, so, um, this this was the song we sang in the dark, putting out flakes of hay for the cows. So, anyway, that's it. It's from part of your experience tonight, or from your holiday adventures.
I thought my song, Let Your Love Light Shine in the Checkout Line, would go with that. You could just do some call and response. You get the onions, I got the cash. Let's make a salad, let's make a splash. Fine. Let your love light shine in the checkout line. We've got love, love in the checkout line. We've got humility, humility. in the checkout line. We've got in the checkout line. Let your love light. Shine in the checkout line. What else do we got? Yes. In the checkout line. We got sardines. We got generosity. We've got hope. Let your love light shine in the checkout.